Thank you very much, uh, Dominic, and thank you to uh, Burden Media for this fantastic opportunity. And, and as he said, I'm going to provide you with some provocative ideas. Uh, and I think most of you will probably disagree with them, and that's fine. Ethics is about promoting dialogue and getting you to think. Um, we are a part of a genomic revolution uh, where there are three converging technologies. Whole genome analysis, Ian mentioned the, the declining cost of whole genome analysis. You can now sequence a whole genome for less than $1,000. Uh, secondly, stem cell therapy is progressing. But thirdly, in recent years, gene editing has uh, come to the fore. Gene editing is a revolutionary technology that has been derived from bacteria, enabling us to very precisely modify genomes. This is already widely used in agriculture. There are drought-resistant resi wheat, malaria-resistant mosquitoes. But in 2014, Chinese researchers for the first time used gene editing to modify a human embryo. Uh, they used an embryo that wouldn't have been capable of surviving. Um, but this study nonetheless met widespread criticism, not just from conservatives, and religious groups, but from scientists who called for a moratorium even on research into gene editing. So I want to talk today mainly about gene editing and its implications for, the, for health, but I want to spend the second half of the talk talking about how we need to re-engineer humanity. And rather than resisting the concept of designer babies, we should embrace this. First of all, it's important to recognise the resistance to gene editing is based on, on an ethical mistake. Even if you're opposed to creating babies who have been genetically modified, this research is still important for research purposes. And indeed, in the UK, you can perform this research on embryos up to 14 days of age. The idea that it would modify the germline and pass on changes to the next generation, again, is inconsistent with much of our own behaviour in life. Smoking changes your genome and it's passed on to the next generation. Delaying having a child encounters mutations which are passed on to the next generation. Viruses regularly cause uh, inherited mutations. So the idea that we can pass genes on to the next generation is not inconsistent with what already happens. Why do we need gene editing? Well, first of all, there are a large number of over 200 genetic diseases. One in 25 people in the United Kingdom carry one copy of cystic fibrosis. All of you will have three to five recessive mutations that if you were to marry somebody with a similar mutation, you would have a one in four chance of having a child with a genetic disorder. So we could potentially cure these diseases with gene editing. But people will say, well, we don't need gene editing, we can test embryos, test them using whole genome analysis even to identify their mutations. And that's true. You can largely deal with single gene disorders like cystic fibrosis, thalassemia, sickle cell anemia, Huntington's disease, inherit some forms of inherited breast and bowel cancer, using genetic testing of embryos, even though that's banned in Germany. What you can't do, though, is deal with the common diseases, because most common diseases have not just a couple of genes involved, but tens or even hundreds. Schizophrenia has over 100 genes involved. So you would need astronomical numbers of embryos to minimise the chance of having a child with schizophrenia. But with gene editing, you can modify multiple numbers of genes in a single embryo. We've already been able, to, scientists have already been able to modify up to 50 genes in an animal embryo. Now, why should we do this? Well, gene editing offers an enormously, enormous opportunity to treat disease cheaply. Just to give you one example, Gaucher's disease is an inherited disease of metabolism that uh, affects the liver, lungs, spleen, brain, and is often lethal. Now, this has been one of the success stories of modern medicine, because scientists have identified the genetic disorder and produced a replacement enzyme that cures the disorder, glucocerebrosidase. However, this is enormously expensive. It costs £100,000 per person per year to administer this enzyme, which has to be given every day. 
So that's 18 million pounds a year uh, in the UK to treat this disorder. With about 5,000 pounds, you could cure this disorder using gene editing. So the opportunity that gene editing offers for the, for the treatment of disease is so enormous that this research will go ahead. It's also important for developing an understanding of human development, for producing cellular models of disease. So taking tissue from individuals with diseases and genetically modifying it to, to develop drugs, which can be cheap to produce. It can be used to increase resistance to disease. So Chinese researchers have also introduced a, a gene that confers resistance to HIV. And ultimately, it could be used to produce the holy grail of medicine, regenerative medicine or personalised medicine or precision medicine, where an individual has their own stem cells tailored to treat their cancer. Just last month uh, in San Diego, uh, researchers used uh, the so-called Yamanaka factors, a number of, of genetic switches, to reprogram a whole mouse to stop the whole mouse ageing. So I met Steffi at, at Davos a number of years ago, and on, I was on a panel there where I said, you know, we could double the lifespan of human beings today. There isn't a biological barrier to doing that, because we've already done that in mice. And several years later, we're starting to see this kind of research unfold. Indeed, the first human trials have begun with gene editing. So that's the treatment of disease. Gene editing will go ahead. It's important. We will modify embryos, certainly for research, but in the long term, it will happen for the treatment of disease. Now I want to get on to the more interesting part of the talk, and that is not treating disease, but treating normal people, gene editing normal embryos. Now this is a curve for hematocrit. You'll notice that it's a bell-shaped curve. If you're on the left-hand side, you're at an extreme disadvantage in endurance sports. That's why people dope with EPO and blood doping. This is the curve for intelligence. You'll again notice that it's a bell-shaped curve, and if you're on the left-hand side, you're at an extraordinary disadvantage. You need an IQ of 90 to complete a tax return in the US, which means about a third of people lack the intelligence to complete a tax return. Now, they're normal people. They're not, they're not disordered or diseased. Disease is a statistical definition of a level of subfunction, two standard deviations below the mean. So disease is the bottom 2% of that curve. Well, why, what's so special about the bottom 2%? Nothing. It was just picked. You could have defined disease as one standard deviation below the mean or, or less than average. And indeed, where you fall on these curves determines many aspects of your behaviour, your life, your prospects, and even your moral behaviour. So gene editing will enable us to change that curve. So natural inequality is a phenomenon that evolution has created. But it's irrelevant to us where we fall on a curve. What matters to us is how well our lives go or indeed how society functions. And we use diet and education and political reform and social reform to improve people. But we can now start to use gene editing and bio the biological revolution. Many of you will be familiar with Walter Michel's famous experiments on impulse control. If you take three-year-old children and test them to see whether they can withstand temptation of a marshmallow, those who can withstand the temptation, 10 years later, more motivation, more friends, more uh, academic success, and this is more highly predictive of socioeconomic status than intelligence. That's why 10% of children today are on Ritalin, because being low normal in impulse control is an extraordinary disadvantage. Gene editing will be a way of correcting natural inequality. The, the warrior gene that, that uh, was originally discovered uh, in the Netherlands is a gene which is associated with the disposition to violence. And of course, psychopathy is not, in my view, a disease. It's an extreme version of a normal characteristic, hard-headedness. It blends into uh, psychoticism. All of these features of human beings are features which we differ to varying degrees and which have significance. 
So I mentioned before the already long history of modifying uh, other non-human animals. Mice, which live twice as long, mice which have better memory, monkeys which work harder, and Ian, of course, has taken my favourite slide of Supermouse. Now, Supermouse is able to run five kilometres where a normal mouse is exhausted in 200 metres. Why are there no super mice existing naturally? Two reasons. They need to eat twice as much. There wasn't enough food available to sustain that metabolism, or the mutation just didn't naturally exist. But what nature could have created, we can create in a single generation. This shows the enormous industrial engine of biology. And just as we can modify mice to run much further, we could modify humans to run much further. So I'm more interested, though, in ethics. And in 2014, Ingemar Persson and I wrote a book arguing that humans were unfit for the future and that we needed to explore the possibility of biologically improving our nature. Not just improving our intelligence, our impulse control, our disposition to disease, but, but changing our moral dispositions. And this is a very Darwinian view, because according to a Darwinian view of human beings, we didn't evolve with any particular design. We evolved in small groups of 150, morality involved to enable us to cooperate in those small groups, to look after our family and friends, to compete with other humans for resources. We believe we were responsible for what we did, but not for what we allowed to happen. We couldn't affect the distant future, so we don't think in terms of the long term. And yet we don't live today as hunter-gatherers, though we have that same psychology. The great problems of today, such as climate change, are not caused by carbon emissions. Terrorism is not caused by religious fundamentalism. The root cause of these problems is human moral limitation, ordinary human moral limitation. That's that ordinary men was the title of a famous history of the Nazis. Even the Fukushima nuclear disaster is the result of human choice and behaviour because we know what causes tsunamis and we know how to avoid them. 1% of the human population are psychopaths. That's 70 million people not to mention ideologues and fanatics. There's enough plutonium in the former Soviet Union to fuel 20,000 atomic bombs. Ian mentioned biological weapons. Within a decade, it will be possible to manufacture smallpox on a small scale laboratory uh, and disseminate that around the world and kill not just 2,000, 3,000 people, but hundreds of millions of people. So it only takes one out of 70 million psychopaths to do that, or one fanatic or one ideologue. So although the world is safer than it's ever been, as Steven Pinker has argued, the risk that our enormously advanced technology and our globalised world presents us is something that the human animal has not evolved to flourish in. This is a case of smallpox. So the features of today are a globalised world with global collective action problems. The failure to aid that characterises increasing inequality is the result of our, our moral psychological biases and the way in which our moral psychology evolved. We don't believe we're responsible for what we allow to happen, even when we can change that outcome. Inequality is increasing. Uh, and the problems of climate change are regularly not addressed because the tragedy of the commons that represents climate change is something that humans could manage on a small scale when they could observe each other, when they could punish free riders, and when their contribution made a difference. But when you don't know the people who will be affected, and it's in the further future and in a different country, there's huge psychological obstacles to forming policies that will address climate change. So could we breed humans that were better able to deal with these problems just as we've bred dogs to have different characteristics. On the left is a fluorescent rabbit, on the right is a fluorescent human embryo caused by not gene editing but genetic engineering. Just as we've developed performance enhancing drugs in sport that have been highly effective, 
In my view, we ought to start to look at modifying human moral behaviour, not just through laws and punishments and policies, but through gene editing and other biological interventions. And you would say, well, surely our moral behaviour isn't determined by you know, our, our genes or our physiology. In probably the most striking study of the effects of physiology on moral behaviour, Israeli researchers looked at the sentencing decisions of judges according to the time of day. And they found that they were much more lenient soon after a meal and more willing to offer parole. And this progressively dropped the further the case was from the time the judge last ate a meal. Now, whether you end up in jail or not should not be determined by how hungry your judge is. That just shows you that, of course, decisions to offer parole or incarcerate someone are the result of events in our brain which are susceptible to our physiology and are partly influenced by our genes. One of the craziest suggestions of dealing with Hitler in the Second World War was to put uh, female hormones in his food to make him more like his docile sister. This is a form of moral enhancement. And of course that's what happens when we engage in hormonal castration. A number of countries around Europe use hormonal castration to reduce sex drive. This is a crude form of moral bioenhancement. The drugs that we take, the antidepressants that we take, modify our moral behaviour. A very popular antidepressant are the so-called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac. These make people more cooperative, less willing to harm individuals to benefit greater numbers, uh, more willing to forgive uh, transgressions and injustice. Oxytocin released by the oral contraceptive and breastfeeding and sexual intercourse promotes cohesion within groups but increases outgroup derogation. Uh, in Oxford, one of our students, Sylvia Turbeck, looked at implicit racism, unconscious racism. All of us, as human animals, are wary of outgroups. Now, of course, this can be overcome, but when there are environmental stresses, people return to racist, tribalist inclinations. Sylvia showed that the drug propranolol can reduce this implicit racial bias. Ritalin, I mentioned before, is both a cognitive enhancer and a moral enhancer. When given to criminals with attention deficit disorder, it reduces violent reoffence by 30%. Again, if you were able to gene edit improved impulse control, this would be a benefit to the individual in terms of long-term planning, their socioeconomic prospects, their life prospects, and also a benefit to society. So our biology is not some virgin, pristine forest. It's a distribution. Some people are lucky and some people are unlucky. The genomic revolution enables us to change that distribution. The levels of altruism that we display, the levels of empathy that we have all vary. And empathy is reducing in the United States. Large meta-analyses have shown that empathy is... Now, you have to ask a question, is that good or is it bad? And if we can change it, should we stay with the status quo? or should we increase it or reduce it? We will have the power to do that. We are at a crossroads, and I want to finish just with a few words about love. Because, of course, the most highly coded behaviour is mating behaviour, behaviour we share with other mammals. People think that love is mysterious. We write enormous numbers of, of, of novels and poems and create films and songs about love. But love is the way in which our genes are passed on to the next generation. And love, for many people, isn't working. 50% of relationships end in divorce. And the same evolutionary story I gave you around our own moral dispositions and limitations can also be given around why relationships don't conform to many people's ideals. I'm not here endorsing lifelong monogamy or marriage or polygamy. What I'm saying is that science will give us the power to change ourselves to meet our ideals. There are three phases to any relationship, lust, attraction, attachment, and each of these is mediated in different parts of the brain by different neurotransmitters. Um, 
lust promotes mating with an appropriate partner. Attraction is falling in love with the particular aspects of an individual, and attachment is the long-term pair bond that enables mammals to rear their young. In the animal model of attachment, the, the vol, scientists have already been able to engineer monogamy genetically um, by modifying the vasopressin receptor uh, gene. Indeed, uh, changes in this area associated with attachment, the vasopressin system, one of the one common uh, genetic change, not a, a mutation but a polymorphism, has been associated with less stable relationships. Um, so people with the so-called 334 version of the uh, arginine vasopressor receptor uh, gene have been shown to have more relationship breakups. Their spouses are less willing, are less satisfied with the relationship. And you can select for this now using genetic selection. But you'll be able to modify that gene uh, to bring about an individual with a different orientation towards relationships. Oxytocin promotes pair bonding and has been used in couples therapy. So just to finish, one recent drug, 2015, was approved by the US FDA, which affects the serotonin system, to increase sexual desire in women, to treat a new disorder, hypoactive sexual desire disorder. Now this is another example of how medicine invents new diseases in order to be able to give new drugs. In my view, this is not a disorder, it's a version of normality. And it uh, increases the number of sex sexually satisfying events women experience. Even the level of sexual desire that we have, of course, is a, uh, is a result of activity in our brains and is capable of being modified both at the biological level but even at the genetic level. And I'll finish with this objection that many of you will have. Isn't this an example of Nazi eugenics and doesn't this invite coercion? Eugenics is alive and well every day when we select against Down syndrome or genetic disorders. The objects of Nazi eugenics and indeed European and American eugenics were intellectual disability, psychiatric disease and criminality. And psychiatric disease, Huntington's disease, and intellectual disability, Down syndrome, are the objects of modern clinical genetics. What distinguished Nazi eugenics was that it was coercive, people were forced to have sterilizations or indeed killed. It was based on a view not about what was good for individuals, but what was good for society, and it was based on bad science. Modern liberal eugenics is free, people can make their own decisions. It's aimed at the well-being of children, and it's based on good science. So if we maintain those kinds of principles, giving parents the power to make decisions based on a reasonable conception of well-being for the child and based on good science, we avoid the risk of Nazi eugenics. Evolution did not design us to be happy. It didn't design us to create a safe and secure and just world. It just created an animal capable of surviving long enough to reproduce we now have the opportunity to redesign evolution, to create what might be called rational evolution. What matters to us is well-being, security, happiness, justice, equality. We can now modify ourselves to achieve those goals. Not only should we be disease-free, we should have good lives and we should have moral lives. Thank you.